Hello and welcome to episode 45 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live streaming career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary singer-songwriter musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. This week I am joined by the brilliant author and journalist John Harris. Now, if you've read music magazines over the years featuring Paul Weller, then chances are you've read one of John's articles about the great man. Follow John on Twitter and you'll find a man who is clearly a massive super fan of The Jam, The Style Council and Paul Weller's solo. He's got to spend time with him on tour and one of his interviews for Heavy Soul may well have made this very podcast obsolete. Keep listening, you'll find out why. So let's get into it. John Harris, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me on. The people you've had on so far, honestly, I was thrilled to be asked. As you doubtless know, I like writing and talking about him and the Jam and the Style Council particularly. It's all right to talk about the Style Council. It wasn't for many years, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Am I right in thinking you're in Somerset right now? I live in Froome in Somerset, yeah. Oh, so my old stomping ground when I was a broadcaster. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what, round here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the host of The Breakfast Show on Orchard FM. Is that going back away? Did that, did that become The Breeze or something? It became, um, what did it become? GWR, I think. So yeah, this was 2000, this would have been. So yeah, well. Oh, where were you, so where were you based? Taunton in Somerset. Oh yeah, no, that's deep Somerset. Somerset's a big place, right? So Taunton's like an hour from here. Yeah, it's massive, isn't it? Right. So you're closer to Bath and not too far from Glastonbury. Yeah, we're more in right? the Bath, sort of Bath, Bristol. We're, we're the sort of fag end of the Bath and Bristol <laughs> conurbation. You know, we're not... <laughs> Uh, most of the way to Dorset, that's somewhere different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, look, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I know that you're a massive Paul Weller fan. So um, w when did this love of Weller start for you? <laughs> well, when I was very young. I think there's a I think there's a point in the Weller documentary Into Tomorrow, which is very good, where he talks about the fact that the jam, as well as attracting people sort of higher up the age range, were like a playground thing. He says that there were a lot of really young kids at the gigs. I was too young to go to a jam gig, but my first single that I bought, as far as I recall, was Strange Town. Oh, not, I was a, not a bad one to start with. How old good. were you? Uh, pretty good. When I was nine years old, and Boots sold records. Princess Street in Edinburgh, I think. I was visiting my auntie who's, who lives in Scotland. I bought that. And the background to that, I think, was the fact that my cousin David, who lived in South Wales, he was a huge Weller fan and still is. I mean, he had bootlegs, do you know what I mean? Vinyl bootlegs of jam gigs. And he had a pencil sketch of Paul Weller on his, you know, on his <laughs> dressing table. And, <laughs> and he would talk quite eloquently about the political aspects of the jam and all that. So I was quite, I think I was quite taken with that. Uh, and that sort of inspired me. And then I sort of started finding out for myself. So I bought Strange Town and I bought Going Underground as well. Those two records. And I just started, you know, they were around, don't forget. I mean, if you watched like Saturday morning telly or whatever, you know, they would be on every so often. There's a famous clip of them on Tiz was, right? The, the Saturday yeah. morning show. So they were sort of in, in your world, you know, even at that young age. And I suppose I felt, you know, I was a sort of slightly weird, precocious little kid. So I sort of, Felt that was a sort of token of burgeoning maturity or some nonsense. And um, <laughs> I didn't get to see them, which I still, you know, when I meet people who saw them, I'm still very envious of that. You know, I've spoken to people who saw them five or six times, seven or eight times, and, you know, I can't compete with that. It was there from a pretty early age. And I, you know, I felt the shock of them splitting up and all that. You know. That's such a young age, isn't it? So the Style Council would have been during your teens. And did they really connect with you as well? That had a more direct connection with me than the jam, just because I was able to go and see them, right? Perfectly suited the person I was at 13, 14, 15 years of age. Passionate about politics or? Yeah, I'm from yeah. a political household. So my father's father my grandfather in south wales was a coal miner and i mean you know i was brought up in a very sort of labor socialist household you know so all that was waiting and just being you know politically aware and, and au fait with what you what i was seeing on the news and all that so all of that fitted but also it had this lovely sort of quality of speaking to i don't know you know when you're that age you want to know which clothes to wear and what books to read and you want your it's when you're beginning to be conscious of presenting an image to the world you know and i loved that aspect of the star council you know for my sins i took two language o levels in my options purely because of the star council because <laughs> one of the adverts it, one of the adverts it said a new single by New Europeans. And there were these promotional pictures, you're doubtless aware of this, of Paul and Mick Talbot reading uh, La, Chia La Corriera della Sera, the Italian paper. Right. And I think one or other's reading a French newspaper. And I thought, well, this is it, isn't it? I've got to be a European. So I took two language O-levels. 
And I, I smoked French fags, I had white trousers, and I was in a band by then as well, you know. I wrote songs about unemployment. Not something I knew anything about, but... <laughs> <laughs> so there was a real I yeah, I mean by that point I was really hanging on his and their every word, I think. So they were the Star Council were my band. I still feel very fondly about them. And I I think certainly in the sort of second half of their career, they were much misunderstood. And did they mean much to your family then? So you mentioned, you know, political family and um the coal mining thing and, and Yeah, they were like all that. aware of it. Yeah, they were all aware of it. I mean, my dad was born in nineteen thirty six and thankfully he was the sort of dad who'd be like, Well, you know, why does it have to be so loud and you can't even understand the words and all that? He's, le- he's less like that now. So I don't think he was that interested. My mum was quite sort of interested in it, just because I think because of the fact that pop music is a very sort of dazzling, interesting thing. And the Star Council were a pop group, right? I mean, they were, in their own way, they were a sort of archetypal 80s pop group. We thought very carefully about what they looked like and the image they presented to the world. But my younger brother is two and a half years younger than me. I shared a lot of this with him, you know, so he would sure a lot of Jam and Star Council, Weller fans have this in common, right? So we would, most of those gigs that I went to see Star Council, I think I, he was part, at least part of the gang that I, I went to those gigs with. It's just there all the time, you know? Yeah. Can you remember the first Star Council gig you went to then? Uh, I think the first gig I went to was in the uh, on the Internationalist Tour in 85, when Our Favourite Shop came out. I don't, I'm not sure that the, um, prior to that, those gigs in 84 around Cafe Blood, I'm not sure they even, they might not have come to Manchester. I don't recall opportunity being aware of the opportunity to go and see them. So yeah, Internationalist was the first time I saw them of our favourite shop time, which was perfect. And then I saw them three or four times subsequently. I was on the first night of the Red Wedge tour was in Manchester, year 86. I've still got the t-shirt somewhere. It says, now that's what I call socialism. <laughs> there was a weird tour called Renaissance, which came in between our favourite shop and Costa Loving, which I went to. And a couple of others, I can't recall. I saw them, you know, more than three times and um, followed it right through with a bitter and messy end. <laughs> now, for those of us that never got to experience the Star Council live, it was a very different live experience in terms of the setup of the gigs and the structure and to what we would probably be used to today in the sense that the Star Council quite often would come, certainly in the very early days, came on first and then there was like yeah. an interlude and other bands and then they came on again at the end. But they were. It was a bit more traditional when I saw them. The support act... On the first gig I saw, I think this is correct, was Phil Jupiter's, who was uh-huh. then called Porky the Poet. And he came on and did his rhymes about the youth training scheme and how awful Mrs. Thatcher was and all that. And we all sort of cheered along. Uh, and then he went off and they and they came on and played a, I think they were on stage for at least an hour and a half, possibly two hours. It was quite a long show. But it was quite sort of confrontational, you know, from time to time. He, he knew or they knew they were sort of challenging the audience. Mm-hmm. I remember the first thing he said, and I've never got to, I've Googled this, I've never got to the bottom of what was going on here. They came on and after the first song, Weller said, um, I don't know whether they call him Paul or Weller in this context, Paul, let's call him Paul. Paul, <laughs> he leans into the microphone, he said, we've got the edge from U2 coming along later to play some guitar, right? <laughs> A lot of the audience like you too. And I was only 15. I didn't know my arse on my elbow. So we all cheer. Yeah, the edge. I don't like you two at all, incidentally, right? But everyone goes, yeah. And then it's like, he's saying that to wind you up, isn't he? He's saying that to sort of gauge how many rockish throwbacks there are in the audience and what he's up against, right? Ah, okay. <laughs> I've got an audience of you two fans here. You know, there was this interesting sort of dialogue going on, you know, and, and various resentments. And I was aware in the extended circle of people that I knew, people who dropped off when the Star Council just got too far out for them. But that made it even more worthwhile hanging in, you know. And I honestly thought they could do no wrong. I mean, people say, oh, the cost of living, what an awful folly. Well, I remember I bought that and I taped it and I took it on holiday to Spain, where our family holiday was that year. And I sat there and listened to it until I liked it. Confessions of a Pop Group, I thought was a masterpiece and still do. So I personally didn't have a sense of it kind of tailing off. I thought, I just loved it and it tried to immerse myself in it throughout. Really. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because I think quite a few people have talked about like Jerusalem, the film, and Costa oh, Loving as being. On VHS. <laughs> yeah, I had it on VHS as well, but not the, orig- the original from the time, but I, I subsequently bought it because I, I discovered Paul in the solo years. So I kind of then dug back into the you know, everything that had gone before. And so I'm guessing the, the band career didn't take off, although you do have guitars in the background. So, you know, your life really since has been a journalist of everything political nature, but starting out in music and focusing on that right yeah so like most or, or a lot of them music writers i'm a frustrated musician <laughs> so um we had this band i mean people forget you know in what what some people would call the provinces there was another mod revival right so there was a mod revival in 79 80 which is the one secret affair and the purple hearts and squire and all that which was directly inspired by the jam and then there was another one 
which actually had various forms in parts of the southeast of England, the Medway towns, and that it sort of gave rise to um, the prisoners. And I think the milkshakes had a bit of that going on, right? But up north, there definitely was another mod revival in sort of 83, 84. But it was kind of ongoing, you know. Like you could go to Shelley's Shoes on Carnaby Street and buy bowling shoes with as supplied to the jam written in my several pairs of those, you know. So the mod thing was was around still, is what I'm trying to say here. We formed a band in that spirit. There was uh, most of the band was a year older than me, which is a it's a big gap when you're in secondary school. But word got around that I had a guitar and I wrote songs, so they came to see me. That's when I sort of went mod crazy, really, and started paying close attention to what to wear and all that stuff. And for a long time, we were like a tribute band. <laughs> before people knew of such things. I mean, for the first... <laughs> we did reach a point where I think about at least a half, possibly more than that, of the set was jam songs. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and then, and then you know, that's what that's how bands start. And sort of mindful of the example set by the Style Council, I think we, um, we started writing our own stuff that was very sort of influenced by that. We were quite good at, at the end. This was, I mean, in our sort, sort of circle of friends and associates were people who subsequently formed Doves, you know, that band. They were, the, yeah. Doves are from Wilmslow, the same town as me. So um, they were around. A guy called Joe Roberts, who uh, had at least one hit single sort of around the time of Acid House. He had, a, he had a mod band called The Risk. And all of us were sort of um, jam obsessives to a lesser or greater extent. And um, yeah, so that went on till I was sort of 15 or 16, until the bass player and the and the drummer discovered pubs, really. <laughs> and they had a jump on me because they were a year old. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, young in. <laughs> and at that point, I, uh, I decided that I should, I went off to Sixth Form College and decided to take my studies seriously. And as a writer, I mean, I don't know that there's anybody you haven't written for, quite frankly. And I'd forgotten about Select Magazine until I started doing a bit more research for this. I, God, that's bloody brilliant. So you're editor of Select Magazine, you're a melody maker, enemy, um, have written for the Q. Every month I still mourn the fact that that doesn't come through my letterbox anymore. Um, Mojo, Rolling Stone, all these yeah. great publications. What an amazing yeah. career. Well, that's very nice of you to say that. I started with a, a music really called Sounds, you know, Right. People forget there were four music weeklies would come out every Wednesday or thereabouts at one point. Sounds, Enemy, Melody Maker, and Record Mirror, right? I mean, can you imagine? So you go to WH Smith's or wherever it is, right? And you've got, I mean, it, this much <laughs> paper print to get through all about pop music, right? Which completely defined the culture of music. Again, this is the this tells you about the context in which the Jam and the Style Council worked, right? Is that, thank God, Paul Weller was really good at interviews and had something to say and would tell you about which books to read and all that because that was the that was the sort of discourse he was working with and that was the, uh, that was what people wanted to read. Mm. You expected much more of people in groups than just you know turning out a nifty hit single once every few months. You know they had to have a whole world constructed around them in order to fill these publications. You know I was a sort of child of all that really. So at one point I had a Crombie coat like he wears on the cover of Snap. You know I put toilet roll to a, a sufficient sort of height in the pocket so that when I put a, a folded up copy of the NME in it, you could see the logo. <laughs> That's how much of a wanker I was. But um, <laughs> so amazingly, I, I sent some unsolicited reviews to Sounds and the NME and I got a, subsequently got a freelance gig at Sounds. Sounds folded in 91. I worked for the Melody Maker for a bit, which was a pretty unhappy experience, really. And, um, and then Steve Lamack, who's now a, a very successful radio presenter, as you know, he recruited me to the enemy and I was off then. I mean, that's when I did it full time and moved to London and all that. Amazing. Yeah. And, you know, and I'd hurtled through pretty much all of it by the time that I was 29, 30. Again, this is very well or influenced, you know. I initially thought I shouldn't be doing it beyond 25, right? Because that's what he said in In the Sea. I mean, God knows, because he was still doing it. So it's like, well, hold on a minute, you've slipped free of your own rule here. So maybe I should be doing the same. But uh, I thought that was really important. So I sort of carried on doing it full time till I was 30 or thereabouts. And then I still write about music, but thankfully I don't have to go to gigs five nights a week anymore. I still have tinnitus from doing that. So. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> Around that time is the is the comeback of Paul Weller, is it? although you followed him all the way through to the bitter end of the Style Council. But it was almost this um, you know, this regeneration of Paul, in a way, of this first solo album, Wildwood, Stanley Road, all the way through that. You know, you're a music journalist writing about the music that you love, which must have been so exciting. Yeah, but it goes back further than that. Because when I was at university in Oxford, um, the Paul Weller movement toured. This is very early on, right? I mean, this is the band with Henry Thomas from Rock School on bass. So what's this, like 1990? <sighs> it's whenever Into Tomorrow comes out, 91. And I had that record. I've got a 12-inch of it somewhere, which I think is worth something. Um, and I went to see it. I've got a T-shirt somewhere that's got a, it's like a football shirt with a number. It's got the number 10 on the back. 
you hear those stories, don't you? They're in those documentaries about, oh, no one came and we played to 40 people in Newport. Well, I'm, I'm sure that's true, right? But in at the Oxford Apollo, it was full, right? And it was great. Because as much as I went, I followed the Style Council through and, you know, whatever they did, I thought was great. Although I was, a, I was sort of mystified by the house music turn. I wouldn't be now, but I was then. I did like the fact that with the Paul Weller movement, it was sort of loud again and the guitar was out and I'm sort of sufficiently, uh, was then traditionally my taste that I sort of got off on that. And then the first album, which I really, really liked, the first solo album, which I really liked. And I, around that time was just when I'd started at the NME in 92 and they, um, I managed to get commissioned to review them at Manchester Apollo and to write, it was the first time I'd written professionally about it. And that appeared on Twitter the other day, that review. Oh, really? I'll, I'll have to yeah, dig I say that, that he's going to be the British Neil Young, which wasn't my line. That was a line I nicked from Yastin George, who I worked with, who was, who was another big Weller fan. But that's kind of true. You know? I mean, that, I, that's not a bad thing to have in your first Paul Weller review. And the gig was great. The only thing was, as, as he did then, he didn't go anywhere near his back catalogue. He had, he had with the Paul Weller movement, I think for just for want of things to, enough things to play. But by that point, he had the first solo album and the first stirrings of, um, of Wildwood. So he, the, I think that was round about when The Weaver was coming right. out as an early single. But he played Man in the, Man in the Corner Shop. And the whole, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, they liked his, the new stuff, right? But then when you hear, no, 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 no. God, it was like being on a football terrace. I mean, it was just unbelievable. For like three minutes in this gig, it was like you were in a completely transformed environment, right? And then the end of that song comes and then, you know, it, it drops down, you know, because that, all that stuff was still in the air. I mean, again, you know, it's some mark of his artistic bravery, I think, that he faced down audiences for that long mm. and said, I ain't playing jam stuff. You've had that. This is what I'm doing now. We'll come on to this, I'm sure, in a bit. But when I was on the road with him in Ireland, writing a feature about it for the enemy, I stood and watched the gig with Anne, his mum. And she said to me, it was in the piece, she said, I wish you'd play a couple of the old things, you know, going underground or something like that. <laughs> I was thinking, well, you're not the only one. But he did it. <laughs> yeah, and it seems that times have changed now where he uh, realises the legacy that that band left and, and is, is, is willing to look back a little more. And, and there's still the so many little surprises that he digs out from the jam catalogue now. Where you kind of go, God, I haven't heard that one. On the last tour, um, Precious came out a couple of times and I was like yeah yeah I'm playing running on the spot from the gift yeah. again I thought that was great um, and he's careful enough not to play going underground he doesn't play going underground right I mean there are certain things that you have to just leave alone I think yeah and I've noticed even with some of them it's almost like the, the band members are doing them so I think it was was it art school or something like that yeah, that um, Andy Croft sings the art, yeah. sings art school our band that was our band <laughs> That was our little mod band's opening song, A G D E, and my voice hadn't broken. I'd go one, two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I'm going to fast forward to 1997, if that's all right, because I had I had a little bit of envy around this time. So at this time, I was fully into Weller. First solo album's been um, been great. I loved that. You know, Wildwood, Stanley Road. He's right at the top of his game. Um, yeah. And then Heavy Stole comes out, and I'm working um, I'm working part time at a radio station desperate to become a radio presenter. And this thing here arrives in the post one day. So You've this is, one. I've got one of these. So this is Heavy Soul, Have It and Have It Large. And this is a Paul Weller interview promo CD of you chatting to Mr. Weller about Heavy Soul. So it's like a promo C for, CD for Island Records to plug the album. Um, so how did that all come about? And I'm probably skipping through a whole bunch of stories. So let's pick oh, them up. You're skipping, but, you're skipping over this. I'm holding oh. up his first NME cover since 87, which I oh. wrote. Oh, okay. So, so take me back there. What what year was that then? Front front page that of NME. Oh, so that was like that's the most amazing. You know, in terms of me and my sort of Weller fandom and um, getting to know him. You know, you know, that was the watershed. That was the most amazing thing. And that was what Stanley Road time when I'm um, hung up came out. Okay. So what happened was Wildwood had come out. I was sort of somewhat tentatively received by the critics for what that's worth, but it became obvious that. I mean, I thought that was a great record, right? I still, I think, when Push Comes to Shove, my favourite of his solo records, just because I associated with that period. You know? Some of us at the enemy, there was a little clique of sort of mods at the enemy by then. And uh, me and Yestin and Paul Moody, Ted Kessler, I think was around, who subsequently edited Q. And we were sort of pushing to get him on the cover. In the teeth of an editor, Steve Sutherland, who didn't like Paul Weller at all. So I don't know whether this is true. <laughs> In my head, it was like, you know, you had to push a bit. But then it happened, and I was asked to do it. So the features editor said, do you want to go on the road with Paul Weller? Yes, I do. <laughs> wow. Fair play to him. It was old school, right? Because 
time was when you're a music journalist, you write a feature, you go on the road with someone for, you know, like an, like an almost famous, you know, you go for a, quite a long time. Now, I was on the road with him in Ireland for about five days, which isn't bad. They played in Dublin, um, Cork and Belfast. And Belfast was a big deal because he, he hadn't played in, in Northern Ireland since 77. There was a thing about the jam having Union Jack jackets and getting death threats from terrorists, you know. So it's quite a big deal. It was an amazing thing to see. And there was no... You know, I was on the bus. That's mad, man. So you're hanging out every day. I was on the bus. An extremely welcoming, hospitable thing, you know, in hotel bars. His somewhat comedic tipple on that tour was Quantro and Lucas Aid. We were all encouraged <laughs> to try Quantro and Lucas Aid. At one point, I sat in, I think, in Steve Craddock's room, smoking jazz cigarettes, listening to Band of Gypsies by Jimi Hendrix. Paul was there. I mean, this is quite the things that dreams are made of. It was a bit sort of, wow, you know. Well, your internal monologue is a bit like, wow, look at this. Man. I bet when you bought Strange Town in Boots in Edinburgh, you didn't think this was going to happen. <laughs> but also, presumably, at the back of your mind, you've got to think, I'm writing an article here, so I've got, I've got to think about how this is going to, I'm going to tell this story and what this is. Oh, yeah, but you're at time it. off. I mean, I didn't put in the article that I smoked jazz cigarettes and listened to Jimmy <laughs> Hendrix. That's, you have to have some sort of me time, something that's just for you. But there were some quite striking moments on that trip that were in the piece. Quite by chance, they put on the bus, they put Irish radio on, and Bruce Foxton and Rick Butler came on promoting their book our story. And I, I sat there watching Paul Weller listen to Rick Butler and Bruce Foxton. Well, that was like, wow. And then at another point, we were sat on one of those, you know, four seats, one table on a tour bus. And he said to me, "What?" and just innocently, he didn't know. He said, what's the first record you ever bought? And I said, do you really want to know? <laughs> he said, yeah, I said, Strange Town. It's like, wow, okay. You know. I think by, up to that point, he'd been used to being interviewed by people who were sort of from the same background of his musical generation. And I'm 11 years younger. And Tony, his PR, Tony Crean said, bring some music for him to listen to. So that, again, was a bit daunting. Do you know what I mean? Because he was into Neil Young, or was newly into Neil Young. Um, and Britpop hadn't happened then, really. I took a tape that had bands from America I thought were sort of Neil Young influence. So it had Buffalo Tom and the Gigolo Arts and Grantly Buffalo and stuff on it. And he really liked the Gigolo Arts as a version of Serious Drugs by the BMX Bandits. He, he, kept, he played that a couple of times on the bus after I giving him a tape with it on. It was an, just all of it was amazing. He, he made a tape for me, which <laughs> which I've still got. The track listing didn't cover all the tracks. So some of it, I didn't know who it was. And this is pre-Shazam and Spotify. I spent eight years singing people coming out of the rain by Parliament until I found out what it was. <laughs> <laughs> what is this song? It goes like this. But that was, it was really nice. So I did that, and then I think I interviewed him at least once or twice more. And then um, I interviewed him for Q, and the Beatles were on the cover. So your listeners won't be able to see this. But I remember buying all these magazines you're showing. I remember I you know, getting these in the first, shops, yeah. This was his first big Q feature. The headline is Still Smoking. Isn't that lovely? Still Smoking. Nice, nice. That look around that time was so cool. Was really well, great. Yeah. And also the other things, don't forget, I love that band. The Yolanda Charles, Helen Turner, Steve Craddock, Weller, Steve White. It was Weller and Two Women and Two Men. It was the band that played Glastonbury in 94. And that's not, not knocking the other bands because all these bands are good, always. But um, I really loved that, that band. I thought they were great. Yolanda Charles especially, amazing bass player. So, um, yeah, that was all, all that was going on. And then I suppose just because in the course of my work, I, would, I got it to the point of sort of crossing paths with him once every six months or once a year. Then they just asked me to do the promotional interview for Heavy Soul. But they're not very challenging things. I mean, you just got to say, tell me about this album. Why is it called Heavy Soul? What circumstances did you make it? It was quite a nice afternoon. I went to Whitfield Street Studios in the West End. He was producing Carleen Anderson. And I watched him dub a single sitar chord onto a Carleen Anderson track. I thought, God, you must be thinking in detail. He said, hold on a minute. And he walked out of the control room into the studio floor, put on his cans and just went, dring, and then put the sitar down and came back in. <laughs> so it made all the difference to that Carleen Anderson. <laughs> So yeah, but that's how that, that's how that happened. They cut, they fetch a bit of money those things on eBay now. I think. Well, I wouldn't say that it's great because I also it reminds me of my radio career because I have to be honest with you, I spent quite a while trying to um, dub myself into that interview with me having a conversation with Paul, chopping ah, you, chopping you, you out. Yeah, could I, could I sit? Could I make it appear like Paul was coming on my show? No, is the bloody answer because you were too the two of you were too busy talking over each other, which was lovely because you clearly got on really well. But yeah, that was what I was trying to do was chop me into it, chop you out. <laughs> 
<laughs> probably all I deserved. <laughs> but it's really interesting to hear. I listened to it again recently ahead of this, and it was interesting to hear the talk of um, the different studios because they've moved away from the manor and they've recorded on you know various different studios. Listen to the fact that you know Susie's Room and Peacock Suit were the first tracks recorded, and got how much I love those two songs and the fact that you talk about the fact that it's kind of like a raw, hard sounding record. And, and we've not really talked about heavy soul on this on this podcast at all. But I love that album. It's a br- bloody brilliant. Much misunderstood. I mean, I think a lot of the people who were sort of wait, spoiling for a fight who wanted to sort of get him, the Stanley Road being as successful as it was, they sort of had their chance. And that record did get unfairly criticised. He was in quite a sort of taut, ang- taut T-A-U-T, angry mood then. But you can hear that in um, Brushed is a good example. When it's, I mean, very ferocious. That's like as much like the jam as he'd sounded for years, that song. Science is a bit like that. I mean, that is taught, T-O-U-T. It does sound like someone who's really kind of wound up, you know. And he's and in the lyrics, he's telling people what he's not. I mean, it's like a big fuck off, isn't it? I have no solutions. That's in um, Peacock Sue, isn't it, that lyric? Yeah. You talk about lyrics, actually, in the interview as well, and I think this is something that it would be lovely to know how much you've talked about this over the years with him as well, because he talks about the fact that it takes him a while, or at that point, it took him a while to often kind of understand what was in his lyrics. You know, as soon as we hear the new album, Fat Pops, around the corner as, as we record this, you know, we'll be trying to draw conclusions from what he's saying and what he's writing, but often he just hasn't had a clue himself until much later, which came through in the chat you had with him, which I thought was really interesting. You know, I think there's a sort of um, a process of evolution or things change, right? So the lyrics in The Jam and The Star Council, are, uh, I wouldn't say they were straight forward because they're often very sort of eloquent and poetic but um you know you just about know where he's coming from most of the time i don't think a lyric like town called malice takes much deciphering either does going underground you know walls come tumbling down doesn't when it comes to love songs you're the best thing is pretty straightforward you know long hot summer is a gorgeous amazing lyric but again you know it's a it's a pretty decipherable song about love and regret and all that. And I think in the solo years, things do get a bit more elliptical and a bit more sort of veiled and interesting. You know, the title track of Heavy Soul is a good example of that. Further down the line, there are things on 22 Dreams and so on that are like that. But I think that's because he's sort of following the sound of the words and, you know, there's more of a sense of the musicality of language and all that and maybe less hung up on the idea of sort of clear meanings. Mm. Whereas in the 80s and the 70s, really, you had to have a clear meaning. I mean, that's the way that music was understood. So I think that sort of evolution in his lyrics is quite interesting or very interesting really I like that because also that sort of goes don't forget and this applies to you I'm sure as well this is an artist who a lot of us have grown up with and it's it's in the nature of becoming older that you feel less certain and more hesitant about things and you're aware of nuance and complexity in a way that you weren't and I think his lyrics reflect that you know so going underground is a young man's song right whereas uh You know, something like Frightened is a song of someone who's a lot older. I mean, they're two completely arbitrary examples, but you you see where I'm coming from. And I think that's carried on, you know. I think on True Meanings, that not all the lyrics are by him, but the lyrics he wrote on there are sort of age appropriate. Yeah, and that's why you feel that, you know, it doesn't feel right for him to be playing Going Underground live. The lyrics don't mean anything to him right now. Yes, that connection isn't there, which is so important for an artist, I think, isn't it? You don't want to just kind of go through the motions. Well, many people would say his life was not in a rut these days. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Now, John, we have to talk Britpop. Let me take you back a decade or so when you wrote the amazing book, The Last Party, Britpop, Blair and the Demise of English Rock. So the book begins in 1994, closes in the first months of 1998, and it talks about this kind of this cultural moment that we had, founded on rock music, celebrity and economics, this cool Britannia idea that we've talked about on the podcast before. And there's all these interviews with all the major bands, Oasis, Blur, Elastica, Suede. Where do you think Paul Weller fits in the mix of Britpop then? (sighs) God, what a question. In the book that I wrote, in order for it to tell a story, it's about quite a clearly defined group of individuals. So it's about, really, it's about Blur and Suede and Elastica and these and this sort of London-based collection of groups and all their sort of rivalries and, and bonds and animosities. And then along come these Mancunians and imagine a house party and they knock on the door, you know, and some suitably fay foppish sort of indie art rock person answers the door and they go, all right, having it. And, okay, that's <laughs> and, upside down. and that's sort of the story, right? But there was more to that moment than those groups, right? Um, and I think by accident to some degree, because the, the legwork had been done before Britpop on Paul Weller's part. I mean, this, the first solo album came out when it did, and Wildwood came out in, what, 93? All of that was kind of building, and, and, and things were being put in place long before Britpop came along. It just so happened that that generation of musicians, so I'm talking about Blur and Oasis, 
chiefly, I suppose. They're all the same age as me, right? They're all people who were born in the late 60s and early 70s. And so the jam in in very similar ways to the, how we discussed at the start of all this were a big thing for them. And so he he was held in great sort of reverence by those musicians. Noel Gallagher is a good example of this. And Graham Coxon, actually. Inevitably, they were going to strike up friendships and play with each other and all that stuff. And then that sort of happened. And Stanley Road is a very sort of vivid part of the Britpop moment. I'm not sure it's a Britpop record, but just because every you know everybody was talking about the Beatles and the Who and the Small Faces and all that again, and punk rock to some degree. It's a really an odd period, all that. I mean, don't forget that the, as well as Blur and Oasis and Suede and all that and Elastica, right? The Sex Pistols got back together in that period. That's 96. The Beatles came back. Yes, so Free yes. as a Bird and the Anthology and all that yeah, is 95. Yeah. So it's like all the periods ever of British music all sort of came back at once. And Paul Weller was in a perfect position because he had this sort of heritage of the jam particularly, but he was also a, a, a very successful sort of cutting edge, vibrant artist. So he had he was sort of doing both. He was there in sort of both capacity. He was there as quote unquote the mod father, but he was also there as someone who was bringing out all this amazing music. So new music. So yeah, I think he was part, I think he, he was sort of part of that mood and that moment, but kept his distance. I mean, it was never going to, it wasn't like he was ever going to be one of those people who wore a Britpop t-shirt and went, no. down the to- <laughs> went down the toilet in 1997, <laughs> which happened to hundreds of people, but it didn't happen to him. <laughs> For me, it was such an important time, but I wonder if this is, is an age thing and I was just starting my career and my you know, work and was I had money in my pocket to be able to go to gigs and all those things that, that probably connect you to the music of, of that time, but does often link you in around age and things like that. But there was also so much going on culturally as well. So things like, I don't know, the Euros, the World Cup, the TFI Friday, all those kind of things really made this period for me when I look back. God, that was a really exciting bloody time, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the last stand of a lot of things, you know. I mean, when we called that book out at the last party, it sort of did feel like, well, I mean, we had the Libertines and the Arctic Monkeys and stuff afterwards, but, you know, that was the last time really that people with guitars, you know, were it would even be conceivable that they sell out two nights at Nebworth and, you know, and there were however many millions of applications for tickets and that guitar rock music for want of a better term was just sort of everybody's property and was just sort of in the culture. It was ubiquitous and Tony Blair and all that was part of that moment. It was an, it was an astonishing thing. I mean, I think in the end it was probably bad for music. That's the story the book tells really because you were, you came to be judged just purely on whether you were commercially successful. You know, I remember walking at the office of some other music magazine around that time and just casually commenting that such and such was a good record. And this voice said, oh, yeah, but it's midweeks, only 19. <laughs> I said, yeah, but I'm not talking about that. I said it was a good record, you see. Do you remember that? So it became very like that. And then everyone had to have an acoustic guitar and sit on a stool and everyone have their lighters out and make it sound like Wonderwall, you know. And it, I, I, So I think that the other thing is, Weller is relevant to this, really. And I was guilty of this, you know. I, I regret that I didn't pay enough attention to a lot of music that was probably more interesting. Probably in people's perceptions of Paul Weller, it was more about the sort of small faces who side of him and what people didn't understand or lost touch with was the Alice Coltrane, George Clinton... Even Cypress Hill, I remember talking to him about, you know, that that side of him, you know, which has flowered, flowered subsequently. But I think a lot of that aspect of music got sort of crowded out. It was quite narrow, really, in its confines, Britpop. Didn't do as much good, you know. I should have been listening to other things. I shouldn't have been listening to Cast and Cooler Shaker, really. I, there were other things to listen to. <laughs> I very much enjoyed the Cooler Shaker, I have to say. <laughs> well, no, no, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> And subsequent years, obviously, um, we've talked on this podcast a lot about the likes, you know, 22 Dreams albums like Wake Up the Naked Shin, Sonic Kicks, but the, uh, particularly this hit run recently of um, you feel, I mean, the fact that he released an album last year and then bang, we've got another one around the corner at the time of recording. It, this this hit rate of songs and albums and the work and that he's producing is remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, according to the rule book, it, it's not meant to happen or it very rarely happens that someone hits this amazing stride that goes on for as long as it has. You know, I mean, as you say, it goes all the way back to 22 Dream. And I also like the fact that it's um, it's sort of true to form going back, you know, in the sense that each album sounds nothing like the last one. I mean, you can tell there's this sort of accelerated evolution. He hates, doesn't he, if you say, well, you've reinvented yourself or, you know, like the, the idea that there's anything premeditated about it. He's just, re- he's restless, right? Totally. The fact that, I mean, you know, 
in, ensure that you can get records as different as Saturn's pattern and then True Meanings and then on Sunset. Is that the order? I think True Meanings on yep. Sunset and this one is astonishing, really. And um, True Meanings in particular, it's like, whoa, where did that come from? You know, I mean, it's a beautifully consistent sort of self-contained piece of work. But the fact that then it is followed by on Sunset, which couldn't couldn't be more different. And like all very good or great albums, those ones lately, it's like they all have, they're almost like different colours in my head. Do you know what I mean? Like on Sunset, is this? it feels like dusk in, in California and it's very sort of pastel shades and, you know, a little bit shimmery. And True Meanings is a much sort of starker, you know, sort of attic-y kind of record. And then Fat Pop is something sort of dazzling and multicolored, you know, and that all of them are completely different. Sonic Kicks is a really interesting sort of very sort of brittle, metallic, weird pop record, you know. I love all that, you know. And, th- and they're the things you associate with artists oh, maybe in their 20s and their 30s when they're that sort of restless. And here, here he is aged, whatever age he is, 60 odd, and it's all happening, you know. Like, I, it's amazing, isn't it, to be still that curious. Every time they announce there's going to be a new record, I was like, wow, I wonder what he's done now, you know. Yeah, yeah, because you, you're right. You know it's not going to be like the previous one, and that's an exciting, what an exciting thing to be part of. But I, I, mean, I think there's only him and Polly Harvey who've, who've still got that in British music. Now I'm going to test you because um, you a, a you love a bit of a Twitter battle um, in terms of Paul Weller. Some of the fans sometimes give you a bit of a caning, but you kicked off lockdown with three months of daily Paul Weller lyrics. I did, I did, ninety odd. Yeah. <laughs> what, what? Where did that idea come from? Well, so. <laughs> It's no big deal, really. It's only Twitter, isn't it? <laughs> I got in the habit a bit up to that point of um, of putting up Weller lyrics when they seem to say something about the news. Right. I think around the time of Theresa May and Brexit, there was a lot. I put up a lot of Confessions of a Pop Group, which has great lines in it. You know, all that. Oh, too busy, too busy uh, recreating the past to think about the future. All that shitty plastic prefab town and all that. All those great lines. You know, I mean, they sort of endure all of those. The vision of England. It depresses me to say somewhat. It hasn't changed that much, you know. You can still paste up a whole street's belief in Sunday's roast beef and it still rings true, you know. So I was sort of in the occasional habit of doing that and I can't remember what happened. I think just that lockdown was so odd, that early period when everything just suddenly went quiet. But again, there were certain lyrics that seemed to speak to it. And then purely to amuse myself, like, how are you going to get through this acutely sort of weird, often tedious experience? Well, part of the answer in my own crap way was to get up every morning and think of another Weller lyric to chuck up on Twitter to see what happened. And then once you started, I didn't want to stop. So <laughs> I did I did 96 or something. Never repeated. It was really nice. It was, and just as a, as a community, as you know, there's a community of Weller people on Twitter who were all really nice about it. And Andy Lewis, who I've sort of come to know on Twitter, the bass player before Andy Crofts, um, he, he would, respond with another lyric when I'd put one up, yeah, you know. Yeah. And it was a really lovely it was a really lovely thing. And the other, you know, to be honest about it, there aren't many lyricists you can do that with. I mean Dylan you can, right? There's not enough clash records for to do it. The Smith I don't particularly want to quote Morrissey anymore. So we I can't do <laughs> yeah, that. he's off the list. <laughs> yeah. He's off the list. So uh, what do you do? So and it works, you know, that on all all aspects of the human condition and the political world and wherever you are, you know. There is a, after all this time, there is a, and with all, all that eloquence, there is a well a lyric for every occasion. And so it proved. <laughs> There's a Spotify playlist. I took screenshots of them all and put them on Tumblr. I don't know why, really. I mean, they weren't getting thousands of retweets or whatever, but it was a, it was a nice diverting thing to do. Yeah. Well, let me test you on three of them. Uh, so <laughs> here we go. Uh, let's see. I shake and fall underneath my sheets, the sunlight creeping from my head down to my feet, telling me to rise and face the light again. That's Frightened from Heliocentric. It's one of the best songs about male angst and insecurity anyone's ever written. It's a bloody brilliant song, I have to say. The favourite, the, the, the choice on this podcast, of Neil Jones from Stone Foundation as well. It's a great tune. Great song. Go to church, do the people from the area, all shapes and classes, sit and pray together. Man in the Corner Shop from Sound Effects. Boom. Again, see, all rings true still. Only no one, has, no one goes to church anymore. But- <laughs> Yes. Uh, and last one, rain clouds came and stole my thunder, left me barren like a desert, but a sunshine girl like you, it's worth going through. I will never be embarrassed about love again. Monday from Sound Effects, which is um, him sort of um, channeling the Mersey poets, Adrian Henry and uh, Roger McGough and Brown Patton. The sort of poetry and, and fascination of the, of, the, of the ordinary and the everyday. It's a brilliant example of it, that song. Monday, so, I mean, there aren't that many overlooked and over, underrated Weller songs, but I think Monday is definitely one. Well done, well done. <laughs> were you waking up and these were just plucked from your head or were you waking up going, let me just have to Google this on A, no, a to Z lyrics? Yeah, there was a little bit of that. 
and maybe a bit of premeditation the previous night. And then the odd time something would happen. I think there were riots, possibly Black Lives Matter related disturbances or protests in the, in the States. Or maybe it was the murder of George Floyd. I can't remember. And I put up um, a stone's throw away. I mean, there, was, there were certain occasions when the headlines would sort of speak to yeah. very clear things. And so it was obvious where you were going. But other times... They were just about sort of, if there were lyrics about quiet and silence, wasteland are all gone away, or you know, any number of things, you know. It was, and it, as I say, it was, that's what everyone was doing then. Music, I don't know whether, I'm sure this applies to you. In that first lockdown, <laughs> God, music was so important. Otherwise, I think we'd have all gone off our rockers, wouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Well, thank God on Sunset came out as well that summer. Yeah, right? exactly. That was well timed, wasn't it? It's true. Um, a couple of things I want to talk to you about before you go. Uh, one is um, Weller connected in the sense that he loves the Beatles. I can imagine that he's really looking forward to seeing this because aren't you the editor on the Get Back book? Is that right? Yeah. So to go with them, um, so Peter Jackson's film, which is um, his his version, his edit of all the rushes, all the footage which was originally edited into Michael Lindsay Hogg's Let It Be film. Um, I mean, this is new, this isn't news, but Peter Jackson for the last two possibly longer than that three years has been re has been cutting this new film which is going to be called get back and um apple the beatles organization have hours and hours i think 60 hours this is over and above or as well as the film footage they left tape recorders on at twickenham film studios and in the basement of apple or just taping and what happened every day right uh, all their conversation and so because I'd written some sleeve notes for the reissue of the White Album, which again, I was just, uh, that was just a lovely thing to be asked to do, you know, who would take that lightly? Certainly not me, right? They then said, well, would I be interested in listening to these 60 hours of, of <laughs> Beatles interactions and turning it into a book? And it's like a, it's coming out to accompany the film uh, later this year, I think sort of September time, as far as anybody knows. And um, it's like a play. I sort of wrote it as a play. It's a three act play. And, you know, a few things happen. Contrary to this idea that they were very, very miserable, there is this noticeable upswing when they get to Apple Studios and, you know, all this music starts to sort of pour out of them, which then sort of blurs into Abbey Road, you know. This idea that they sort of played the roof and it all went wrong and they went to the studio one last time in this terrible mood isn't really true. But also they're quite candid about the idea that this, you know, their time might be up and all that. It's a really, it's a really interesting, God, are you kidding? The Beatles talking. So that's what I did. Yeah, I, I, I turned it into... At their behest, I turned it into a, the text of a book. Wow. Because we all saw the trailer on, what was it, Boxing Day or New Year's Day, I think, wasn't it, for the film? Visually, the colours and everything just looks so yeah. incredible, didn't it? It's amazing. They, at one point, I was, um, as part of editing the, bu- editing the book or writing the book, I was, um, with amazing security precautions, you know, almost to the point it came in, a, in an armoured vehicle, I was sent um, an iPad, one of Peter Jackson's iPads with all the rushes on it. Wow. At, as you say, it's just pin shot. It's like it was all shot yesterday. It's amazing. Yeah, God, I, yeah. And, and you're right, the, the clips we've seen so far, it looks like they're having a great time in, in part, doesn't it? You know, it looks like the, re- the relationships are still there and then they love making music together. Yeah, the truth, I mean, you know, as, as against received opinion and myth, you know, the truth is much more complicated. <laughs> I don't want to give it away, you know what I mean? No, no, no. The truth is much more complicated. Yeah. yeah, I can only imagine you know, Paul Weller sitting next to you, both of you headphones on, listening to that would have been a, would have been a wonderful love affair between the two of you because I, I imagine he would have loved to love that experience that you've had. He's no, no, are you kidding? There's a picture of him and um, and Gary Crowley and Simon Halfen, the Star Council sleep design of various people, on the roof at, at Three Savile Row. I mean, they went on a pilgrimage, right? So I think he's going to be one of the millions of people whose Christmases are all going to come at once later this year. Very uh, oh wow, well, cool. That sounds so exciting. Right, I've got two final questions for you, um, oh. John, before you go. Um, you are allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life it can be the Jam the Style Council or Solo which one's it going to be? Well I've been thinking about this I knew you were going to ask me this <laughs> so I'm picking as it's difficult because you don't have to tell me has anyone picked Long Hot Summer so far? One The Long Hot Summer the, and the extended version the one where it starts again after the after the sort of seven inch edit is over it's an amazing song I, I, I think it might be slightly overlooked I think in his in his canon in his catalogue there's another version of it on Weller at the BBC when he plays it at the piano, it's played with a more sort of orthodox arrangement. And it just shows you that what a brilliant song it is. Also, because it's really brave. I mean, you know, it's only like two years since Funeral Pyre, right? And along comes this record with a drum machine that goes... <laughs> most of which is played on, you know, synth- on synthesizers and all that. You know, it's like this lovely sort of new soul record. And um, I went on holiday to my aunties in Cambridge that summer with my friend Paul Sadler. and. Um, 
those are the days when you f- religiously followed the charts. And I was waiting to find, I think it was either it went straight in the charts or it was on a high climber. And I remember with this terrible reception on a transistor radio, sitting on March station where you had to change to get to Cambridge, hearing that it was at number three. And I think, oh, that's good. Yeah, the Apparis EP. We went on a French school trip to Paris and Boulogne around that time. And I packed my white trousers and my jetons. <laughs> so yeah, that's that sort of peak style council for me, that track. Uh, and also, I mean, remarkable that it, it wasn't an album. It wasn't on an album. You can't, I mean, I can't get my head around now when you think about the amount of singles that weren't on albums. And I know this was a thing, not just from Paul, but, you know, it was kind of the thing back in the day. But it seems incredible that that's not, that wasn't on Cafe Blur or Our Favourite Shop. As a, as a oh, that first run of singles is amazing. Are you yeah. kidding? Speak Like a Child, Money Go Round, Solid Bond in Your Heart, My Ever Changing Moods, the, the band version, What's on the App, Our EP. Big Boss Groove's not on an album. That first run of singles, 80, sort of 83 through 84, was amazing. It was just a fantastic thing to follow. You know, I, I cannot overemphasize this. You know, to go to HMV in Manchester and when I knew these things were coming out and buy the 12 inch and take it home and read the Cappuccino Kid sleeve notes. And you were well aware that whatever was on the B side would not be some dashed off thing. You know, that would be equally substantial and all that. It was a, just an amazing, amazing time. That's why I always hated it when people got sniffy about the Star Council and said, you know, and it was perceived as being a bit absurd to like the Star Council. You know, they were a brilliant, brilliant pop group. One final question for you. So the purpose of this podcast is yeah. for me to be able to have a conversation with Paul, not for me to edit myself into somebody else's conversation like I had intended back in the day with yourself, but you know, to actually be there at Black Bar and have a conversation with Paul over a coffee or a cup of tea or whatever. Um, what should I talk to him about? What should I ask him? Wow. What a question. <laughs> <laughs> Having done it on many occasions, any advice? Any piece I don't, well, he's not that difficult to interview because he's a nice sort of open fella, you know? who's been interviewed enough times to sort of know what's required. It's really nice talking to him. Like anybody, you sort of strike gold occasionally when you, anecdotes are always good, you know, uh, to get him to sort of tell you a little, I mean, even in this Q interview, there's this amazing story about, it's only, a, it's only, it's over in a, in a couple of lines when they're all on the, um, they're all on the plane home from the, the, the San Remo pot festival in Italy. The Star Council, Duran Duran, Spandau Ballet, Depeche Mode and Living, on, Living in a Box were all on the same plane. <laughs> And he says, that would have been the one to put the bomb on. <laughs> <laughs> There's just lovely little an- anecdotal things. I remember asking him about recording the Apari EP in Paris. And he said every day him and Mick would get up and go to the same coffee, the same cafe and have croissants and coffee. And it was like being on holiday. Now that's quite innocuous. But I like that as an image, right? I think they were sort of having such fun and, and sort of realising all the possibilities around. You can see it in those archive interviews. Have you seen that bit of footage on YouTube where he's, he talks about the Star Council as being like a musical Karma Sutra? Yes, yeah, yeah. They fall around laughing and Mick says, oh, I'm glad you stayed, you made your position clear or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That period, I think, ask him about, ask him about that period. Ask him about Cafe Blur and the sort of bravery involved and meeting Tracy Thorne and Ben Watt for the first time and putting a rap at the start of side two and all of that stuff, you know instrumentals and I just I find that period I don't think the fascination of that period has been fully explored yet so I'm sending you in next (laughs) (laughs) John this has been lovely thank you so much for your time man I really appreciate it thank you Thank you. Honestly, that was lovely to do. My thanks once again to John Harris for that lovely conversation. You can find links to things we talked about in the show notes for this podcast. Next up, on the Paul Weller Fan Podcast, I chat with Dave Swift, bass player for the Jules Holland Band and TV's Later and Hootenanny programs. A man who has got to perform with Paul on plenty of occasions on TV and live in concert with some pretty iconic moments and some fabulous recordings in the mix as well. Now, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share on social media, tag a well a loving mate you can also buy me a coffee and leave a review you can find all the details in the show notes get in touch on twitter at weller fan pod or on instagram and facebook it's paul weller fan podcast i'll see you next time